वेलकम टू नेटबुक स्टडी दिस इज द न्यूज पेपर एनालिसिस ऑफ थर्टीन ऑगस्ट ट्वेंटी लेट स्टार्ट द डिस्कशन The first article is regarding uh, President of our country has given her assent to uh, four important bills that have been passed in the Parliament. We have had discussion of almost all the bills that has been uh, mentioned in this uh, newspaper from almost 20 days. We have had we are having those discussions. I don't think it is necessary again to go through with all these things. Even in this article, there is a mention of a data protection bill and Delhi services bill. Even these both bills are also extensively discussed in our uh, video analysis. Uh, let's move to the next article. The next article is regarding United Nations Agency. Uh, there was a two day workshop in a Rajasthan university and uh, this news is about it and in that uh, uh, workshop it has been mentioned that there are uh, some issues regarding gender sensitivity and e even the customs which promote patriarchy the discussion gone through about all these issues there. So, but the exam perspective, what you have to focus in this news is a UNFPA, that is the United Nations Agency. Let me give you guys brief introduction regarding UNFPA. This is important from exam perspective. It is United Nations Population Fund and it is an uh, international development agency and it has been constituted in 1968. The main uh, working area is regarding area of population and reproductive health of uh, people around the world. And the mission is to make sure every pregnancy and every childbirth is safe around the world. See, in 1987, it has been renamed as United Nations Population Fund. Before that, its name was United Nations Fund for Population Activity. So, that's why the same abbreviation is still maintained, the UNFPA. And uh, headquarters is in New York. And uh, it even it uh, gives funding and technological support uh, for uh, statistical activities in various countries, especially if uh, if some agency want to do some surveys or if they want to some if they want to go for some statistical uh, the analysis, this agency fund those activities. The next article is regarding flying fox uh, bats, and this is important from environment perspective. And prelims, these kind of questions are coming again and again. You should be aware of uh, IUCN status and what where exactly these animals are situated. Uh, the news is here that some study has been conducted, and they where they have found out that the roosting activity about these uh, bats take a lot of time in their daily routine. The roosting is nothing but hanging upside down. So from that perspective. Uh, uh, this article is nowhere helpful, but the thing is a flying fox is important from exam perspective. Let me give you guys a brief introduction in that. They are, these uh, flying foxes, uh, fox bats are also called as fruit bats and they are widely available especially in the entire South Asian region and also South East Asian region and they play very important role for the seed dispersal since they rely on fruits as their diet and the it helps in seed dispersing activity of those fruit bearing trees. And uh, these species are often regarded as vermins. This is even categorized under Schedule 5th of, uh, of uh, Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 under our Act. And in under IUCN, these are least concern. And there is a difference between uh, uh, fruit bat, this is a fruit bat and other bats. The, see, these fruit bats, their diet is uh, predominantly fruit. But other bats, if you see, they, their diet, diet is predominantly insects. They are insectivorous bats. And fruit bats locate their food through the sense of smell. And other insectivorous uh, bats, they locate their prey through echolocation. Echolocation is that they give out sound and they analyze the things with respect to the uh, reception of those their own sound. And uh, uh, you have to remember there is one outbreak we had in Kerala, Nipah virus and that Nipah virus outbreak was caused by these fruit bats only. And these are vermins under Schedule 5 of Wildlife Protection Act of 1972. In the next article, there is a mention of boat race that is happening, that is uh, Nehru Trophy boat race. This is very famous boat race uh, that go, uh, happens in Kerala. But here you have to focus from geography perspective that where exactly the Vimbanad Lake is situated in the uh, geography perspective. Let me show you guys on a map. Here is the list of important lakes in our country and Vimbanad Lake is situated here in the southern part of Kerala. Let's move to the next article. 
there is a news on assam rifles again in the newspaper let's revise this topic since it has been coming up continuously newspaper regarding assam rifles and also manipur violence even manipur violence we have covered it very extensively so let's take on to assam rifles uh, with respect to this article this is the oldest uh, paramilitary forces these paramilitary forces are regulated by home ministry and especially this assam rifle is established in 1835 usually these paramilitary forces includes a crps capf sashastra seema bal itbp border security force all these comes under paramilitary forces also called as central armed forces and especially assam rifles play very important role in North, northern eastern india uh, to handle counter insurgency and border security operation and uh, another aspect here you have to remember is uh, the sikkim state and the arunachal pradesh state comes under itbp does not comes under assam rifles this is the distinction you have to remember from this perspective let's move to the next one the next news is about ncrt and it has been mentioned that 19 new member panel has been created for the revision of textbooks and some of the names have been mentioned here out of the 19 members uh, bibek debroy and sudha murthy uh, singer shankar mahadevan vimal kumar these are the some names who will be uh, who will be in this 19 member panel for the textbook revision but what you have to focus here from this article is national education policy and even the, it has been mentioned in this article also that uh, this new, new revision will be based on the national education policy of 2020 uh, let me give you guys brief introduction regarding national education policy and this policy is going to replace the national policy on education of 1986 and we had uh, another policy in 1968 and the, the recent policy was 86 a uh, national policy now the updated policy of national education policy 2020 that is going to take effect and this policy is recommended by k kasturi rangan committee and the main objective here uh, to reform in school and higher education and this higher education in include technical education also and the five foundational pillars for this uh, national policy of 2020 one is everybody should have that access accessibility to the education and this education should be uh, affordable and there should be a quality education in our country and people should have the right to access uh, to this educational uh, systems in our country and government should have that accountability to give better education to the population of our country these are the five, five foundation pillars and you can use this uh, pillars concept in other questions as well if the general question comes regarding the education also you can write it down as a conclusion that uh, this should be the objective of our education system in our country and uh, let let's distinguish the education policy into two criteria one is school education another one is higher education and there are some objectives there are some provisions have been uh, placed under uh, new policy especially for school education let's see those pro those provisions and government is aiming for 100% gr that is gross enrollment ratio in, uh, in school education by 2030 and there are two crore uh, uh, children they are out of the schooling system and government is aiming to bring these two crore out of the school children back to the schooling through an open schooling system and now we are following 10 plus 2 uh, system now that will be replaced by 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 see initial 5 years will be for foundation and next 3 years is considered as a preparatory and next 3 years is middle school and last 4 years is considered as a secondary education and uh, new comprehensive national curriculum for the framework for teachers education even it is focusing on teachers capability enhancement also and this new framework will also be introduced uh, and it has introduced in 20, 2021 and it is going to uh, implemented very soon and let's see from the higher higher education perspective and here uh, the gross enrollment ratio is uh, the government is expected to raise it to 50% at by 2035 as of now it is 26% and uh, government is planning to have uh, under, uh, undergraduate education in a very flexible curriculum either 3 or 4 years with multiple exit option that means that in between a student can take a break and rejoin the course again that flexibility will be given and uh, concept of credit system will also be introduced and those credit system can be transferred also and national research foundation will be constituted to support r&d see recently parliament passed national research foundation bill also that is with respect to this particular policy and education we are going to establish education institute of global standard this is again one of the objectives of new education policy of 2020 and national assessment center parak 
has been created to access the assess the students and another thing is it uh, it is supporting establishment of foreign universities to set up those campuses in india also let's move to the next article in the world page there is a mention of armenia the issue is going on regarding nagorno karabakh region uh, but let us see this from a geography perspective let me show you guys even this question has been asked uh, this year prelims also regarding nagorno and karabakh this was one among the option uh, in the question in prelim preliminary examination here you can see the location of armenia and uh, it has dispute with azerbaijan that is a neighboring country and here you can uh, this, this is where tropic of cancer goes through and take it as a line of reference and you can have a relative location of uh, armenia and azerbaijan in the map and the neighboring countries include turkey georgia russia and here caspian sea is situated and below it is iran here it is one more map here you can see the regions here turkey as armenia and azerbaijan and georgia is here russia is here and below it is iran and let's focus on nagorno and karabakh region this region is nagorno and karabakh region usually armenia and azerbaijan they were a single country in 1991 armenia got independence from azerbaijan usually azerbaijan is a muslim dominated uh, uh, country and armenia is a christian dominated country and this region nagorno region where uh, the christian population is high and armenia claims that this is the region belongs to armenia only even though it belongs it is situated inside the azerbaijan region azerbaijan region and both the countries are trying to have that control over this particular region so that's that is the tussle going on between armenia and azerbaijan region because of this nagorno region uh, this is about this issue let's move to the next one in the next article united nations has mentioned that uh, the isis the islamic state of khorasan is getting high caliber weapons uh, that are handled like very uh, you would see this kind of weaponry system in organization like nato and all and this islamic state is getting this high caliber weapon system is extremely crucial for the security of the entire world this is it about the news but the two aspects you have to focus here one is nato and un uh, un is extremely important from both prelims and mains perspective and you need to know the objectives also so that that would uh, push your uh, writing ability in the mains examination so i'll cover both the things nato and un let's start with un United Nation organization it is an international organization it was founded in 1945 and currently it has 193 members let's see the objectives you by heart these objectives these are extremely important from exam perspective and you can use it in various uh, answers even in essay you can use this the objectives includes uh, international peace and security protecting human rights delivering humanitarian aid promoting sustainable development and upholding international laws these are the objectives of united nations organization and before united nations we had league of nations after world war 1 in 1919 and that have that was created under treaty of versailles and later in 19 1945 with proper standards some upgradation have been done and there was a formation of united nation organization with more power and standards and let's see the various organs of united nations uh, important ones are uh, it has uh, six organs Uh, general assembly security council economic social council trusteeship uh, council international court of justice and UN, un secretariat let's try let's go through one by one the first one important one is general assembly it is main policy making body all the decisions are taken by general assembly see the important decisions are taken through two third majority and rest of, rest of the decisions are taken by a, through a simple majority the important decisions includes uh, especially peace and security related aspect admission of new members or budgetary matters all these will be taken by two third majority and the president of general assembly is elected every year by the assembly only and his uh, tenure will be for one year only and next comes the security council the second important organ of un and it has five permanent members and 10 non permanent members the five permanent members include china france russia united kingdom and united states and 10 non permanent members will be elected for two years by the general assembly on regional regional basis and the the five permanent members they have veto power it means that they can reject any resolution of security council they have that complete power and the third important organ is economic and social council 
usually it is a platform to have the discussion on economic social and environmental issues around the world and it has 54 members and this 54 members are elected by general assembly only for the tenure of three years and the next one is trusteeship council see this uh, trust territory or those territory before they were a colony of some other country see after world war entire geography changed around the world at that time this territory also got independence but this territory were administratively manu uh, they were handled by united nations only or no nations only under the trusteeship council trusteeship council was handling all these uh, self administrating territories now what happened they got after a few years all these territories they started having their own uh, administration and they come out of the trusteeship council now the last trust territory to come out come out of united nation organizations uh, this council was palau in 1994 and after that this uh, trusteeship council uh, it suspended its operation it is not active as of now and the next one important organ is international Coast, court court of justice the headquarters it in hague the netherlands and this is the only united nations a principal organ which is not located in new york and all the 193 members they are automatically they become a party they become a member of icj the main objective here is to settle the legal disputes especially between two states in accordance with the international law and finally the secretariat secretary are nothing but staff members who carry out day-to-day -day activities Let's move to the NATO. NATO is a transatlantic military alliance and it has been constituted in 1949 under the Treaty of North Atlantic Treaty and it is headed by United States and it provides collective, se collective security, uh, uh, security analysis. It was, it was initially constituted against Soviet Union and later after Cold War that uh, main objective was somewhere it was against so I'm sorry, initially it was constituted against Soviet Union. At that time, Soviet Union had a Warsaw Pact. So, there were head to head. Uh, US was uh, supported by NATO and the Soviet Union had a support of Warsaw Pact. And currently, there are 31 members and the headquarters is in Brussels, Belgium. And security of both Northern America and Europe uh, are tied together. Here, the name of the few members have been mentioned. It is like a collective security agency. If any country attacks any one of these 31 countries, then all the countries considered it as a combined attack, then they act together. Let's move to the next one. The next article is regarding tuberculosis. Uh, from past 2-3 months, every Sunday we are having one article uh, which is dedicated to tuberculosis. Today we have two tuberculosis related article in our Sunday edition. Uh, since there are uh, no editorials today, I will cover this one and also FAQ paper, the frequent asked question. There are two articles uh, which are important from exam perspective. I will cover the both the things along with the tuberculosis as well. Let me give you guys brief introduction regarding the tuberculosis before getting to the discussion of this article. See, TB is a it's caused by mycobacterium tuberculosis and is mainly affect the lungs and that is called pulmonary TB and if it affects other organs that is called extra pulmonary TB and it is a contagious disease and it uh, spreads from one person to person through air and the symptoms include a uh, uh, cough with blood at, at some time, chest pain, weakness, weight loss, fever and night sweats and the uh, main aspect you have to remember here is a uh, drug resistant TB. There are two aspects here, multi drug resistant tuberculosis and extensively drug resistant tuberculosis and this drug resistant tuberculosis, the, those got resistance against the uh, first line treatment and they don't respond to the first line anti drug uh, anti uh, tb drugs so this this is a challenge for the healthcare system around the world especially for india india is saving almost uh, uh, more than lakh uh, cases in our country every year tb cases so it is a challenge for our country especially if a patient is with multi drug uh, resistant tuberculosis and it is going to be hectic it is going to it is going to take a lot of time to uh, remove that from his uh, physical body and in india bcg vaccine was first introduced in 1948 in a limited scale and it has become a part of uh, national tb control program in 1962 and there are some global effort also to remove uh, tuberculosis out of the world the world health organization organization has launched fine treat all in tb and it also releases report this report is important global tuberculosis report and india also taken some steps in this direction to eliminate tb from our country that is national strategic plan for tuberculosis elimination and that has been started in 2017 uh, to 2025 now it has been revised 
that 2020-2025 and uh, Nikshai ecosystem that national TB information system Nikshai portion Yojana the another article in this uh, the uh, Indo newspaper today's newspaper is regarding Nikshai portion Yojana because recent in a survey report by Lance and it has mentioned that nutrition good nutrition would help to fight against uh, tuberculosis in a person so that article is primarily focused on uh, Nikshai portion Yojana and another uh, initiative is TB Harega Desh, uh, uh, Desh Ditega campaign. This is it about the basic information of TB. Let's get into the article discussion. India constituted national strategic plan in 2017, uh, especially for tuberculosis. And this was initiation taken by Prime Minister during one of his uh, speech in uh, Monkey Bath, where he has mentioned that we need to work toward tuberculosis elimination in the country. And after that, proper planning has been started. And this plan of national statistical plan, and it has been initially for eight years. And that was started in 2070 to eliminate TB by 2025 from the country. But after three years, people, especially the authorities, they have realized that uh, we are far behind our targets and somewhere we are not able to reach our targets. If we continue in the same manner with the same policy formulation, nowhere we are going to eliminate this uh, TB from our country. So, they decided to make some changes for existing national statistical uh, strategic plan and the new plan was formulated a new plan was launched as a national uh, strategic plan in 2020 and th this had a five years plan to eliminate tb from the country see tb is a very serious issue in our country almost more than one lakh population uh, is suffering from tb and it, this has been mentioning again and again even from health perspective health sector uh, reports also and even world health organization also gave warning to india regarding increase rising the numbers of tuberculosis dis, uh, detection and it it directly affected and if you look at the uh, this plan of national strategic plan even the target has been directly affected due to the COVID pandemic. Our healthcare system was much under the pressure. So, we could not able to handle the target for tuberculosis detection and removal process in our country. Now, government has understood how important it is to eliminate this uh, disease from the country. So, it is taking proper steps. See, as of now, in this article, it has mentioned mainly it is focusing on a diagnosis aspect. And here it has been mentioned what exactly the issue that why are we failing to reach our targets. And main, uh, the reason the author says is uh, we are lacking the diagnostic efforts and diagnostic capabilities are lacking in our country. So, in our country, we are still dependent on sputum smear microscopy and this is a decade old technology and we are still following a, following this technology to find the TB patient in our country but the issue is now the new problem has arised in the country that is drug resistant TB if we follow sputum uh, smear microscopy it is very difficult to uh, find out the drug resistant TB at initial stage stages because starting yes we can find out that person has a tuberculosis but the thing is you you would start giving medication on a first line drugs but what happens if the person is having drug resistant tb then it will it is not going to respond to those drugs and it will take some time for a health sector the healthcare provider also to understand that this person is having multi drug resistant uh, tuberculosis so, as long as we don't focus on diagnosis aspect, definitely we will be lacking, we will be lagging far behind our targets. And he says, the author says that we need to upgrade our diagnostic uh, activities, that diagnosis uh, should be on the micro molecular test level. So, we have to follow molecular advanced test for a TB analysis rather than the age old sputum smear microscopy. But the thing is this testing is extremely low and even the equipment what we got at this time this is also due to COVID-19. At that time we used to have a molecular test for a COVID patient and after COVID has been uh, gone the third wave has gone now the, the, the same equipments are used for a tuberculosis. So what we need is we need spe special dedicated devices for tuberculosis because it is extremely important at this junction of time. So we have to focus on that infrastructure now and we have to give this diagnosis to almost all the uh, healthcare sector around the uh, 
country because now this molecular advanced test kits are available to very few uh, hospitals and very few geographical locations have this uh, advanced technology so we need that extension of these services around the country so that equitably the people will get the advantage of it and this aspect has been uh, understood by uh, authorities also and they made that in the new uh, statistical uh, the new the national strategic plan to eliminate tb they made sure that this was the primary objective that diagnosis should be on the molecular test basis and the uh, objective of nsp is early detection of tb cases and early detect you can only do through the molecular test kit and also you know another aspect is the first aspect is diagnosis and another aspect is even the treatment the path of treatment also it is still depend on age old uh, technology only it is dependent on x-ray and it is dependent on clinical evaluation without bacteriological information bacteriological information gives complete detail that which stage the patient is whether he is recovering or the whether the you know his health is deteriorating everything you have to analyze is from the bacteriological information that gives an appropriate and proper picture but we are still dependent on x-ray technology we are still dependent on clinical evaluation based on x-ray technology this is again another issue we need to address and this also been mentioned under ncp the new uh, national strategic plan so we need to focus on these two aspects as of now and then only we can achieve the target of elimination eliminating the tb by 2025 actually there are some articles coming in hindu newspaper also that the target is going to be extended till 2030 because if you look at it we have only two years and even the number of tb cases that is coming in our country is still in lakhs and nowhere we are nearing uh, for the elimination of these tb cases and we are not even seeing the decline on a yearly basis also so, so we are in a long run by this thing and even for next two years uh, we cannot expect uh, to reach that target so it is going to be elimination of tb uh, the target is going to be extended to 2030 and there are some steps have been mentioned in this article that we need to follow these things to make this uh, particular strategy to work in our country and some steps include uh, replace smear microscopy with molecular test yes entire article is on that only that smear microscopy and versus molecular test and the, even the as a step this is the primary step we need to take that we need to replace that old technology with a more advanced molecular technology especially for early detection of uh, drug, drug resistant tb and also we need to increase the availability of advanced test yes as i told you it, it is limited to very few geographical locations and also only the high tech hospitals so that availability has to be increased for that public participation that public funding is extremely important to make it available and also uh, the device of the molecular molecular uh, device kit is mainly acquired by private sector and to make this entire mission successful we need the help of private sector participation also we can go for a uh, uh, health insurances all these to make this commercially viable so that even private sector will also get advantages at the same time even it will help in the elimination of tb from the country so private sector participation is extremely important extremely crucial for the elimination of this disease from the country and also another important aspect is uh, availability of uh, training personnel government has to take steps in this direction as well see uh, uh, in our country doctors to population rate is extremely low when you compared to other advanced or even developing countries so we need to work on that perspective as well availability of not only uh, doctors but also other healthcare providers well including nurse and physiotherapist all these things these also should be uh, uh, the number should be increased and is a long-term goal and government has to work from this perspective to make our healthcare system better once the healthcare system gets better eventually it has a ripple effects and it helps in a removal of uh, tb all from uh, tb cases also from our country and uh, and the finally the steps uh, mentioned in this article is focusing on the most vulnerable groups uh, vulnerable groups especially includes people who already have tb and people with hiv and people with other health conditions who are very susceptible for the acquiring this particular uh, disease those should be in the focus the mo proper monitoring should go and proper database should be created so that they will be in touch and the further uh, spread of this disease will be restricted will be limited and these are the steps uh, 
Now you can write these steps in your answers as well. This is a very simple step and easy to remember. And you can even if the question related to any other health related aspect also, you can write it down as a way forward also at the end of the uh, end of your answers. And finally, the conclusion the author gives is we need to make this universally access uh, accessible that everybody should get this molecular advanced test uh, at the at, at, at very easy. And also it must be the priority of government to provide this technology to the people because on the whole it is a if being a uh, if being a person or being a victim being a patient if a person want to have a better treatment and he should give he should he has that right to have the better treatment to get better as soon as possible so it is a duty of government to give that to, to make that option available for a patient to have an advanced or a better treatment for his diseases. So, this is the final conclusion the article gives. Now, let's move on to the next one. In frequently asked question, uh, there are two articles. One is regarding article 370 and another one is regarding recent import restrictions on laptops and other uh, computer hardware related aspects. I will cover both the things. Uh, very, There are very small articles and uh, minute details have been given here. Let's get into the discussion of them. It's a series of questionnaires here regarding article 370. The first question the article uh, that poses and even answer has been given regarding that. The first question is why was Jammu and Kashmir given a special status in our country? See, at the time of independence, uh, most of the princely states in our country, either they have decided to join India or they have decided to join the Pakistan territory. And Kashmir is uh, one of those princely states that decided to remain independent and some other states also decided that they are going to stay independent. But later because of some geopolitical actions they decided to join India and some of them decided to join Pakistan. But what happened with respect to Jammu Kashmir was at See, Jammu Kashmir had a connection, economic and cultural connection for both the countries. It had connection with Pakistan as well and it has cultural connection with India as well. So, at that time, state did not make any immediate, it did not take any decision to join which country. So, it took time from both the countries, Pakistan and India that we, are, we will think over it and we will uh, uh, give our decision later. So, at that time, what happened? There was an infiltration from Pakistan side. And it was a mass infiltration. It has been told that that armed forces only they entered Kashmir region as a uh, civilian attire in a civilian attire to attack the administration of uh, Jammu and Kashmir. At that time, it was held by Maharaja Hari Singh. So this mass infiltration created a havoc in Kashmir. So at that time, the Maharaja he asked India's help to deal with this issue. But what India told is, see, we have not done any official agreement. Without that, India cannot send its army or any security personnel into others country to to take any action. At that time, Maharaja agreed to sign an agreement with India that we have an official connection with the Indian uh, Dominion. So, at that time, India uh, the India and uh, Jammu and Kashmir, they signed an agreement and that agreement is instrument of accession. According to that agreement, the India, uh, the Dominion of India took control of defense, uh, defense communication and foreign affairs and uh, it gave that promise to the Jammu and Kashmir that rest of the things except three, these three issues will be handled by Jammu Kashmir only. The state government will take all the decision regarding all the issues except these three issues. This was the arrangement, this was the special status arrangement done between central government and the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And the next question come, was this accession temporary? This agreement of that center will be having uh, three issues under his control and rest of them will be under the control of state government only. Was this a temporary arrangement? Now, that is the next question. See, at that time, India India still did not had a constitution. The constitution assembly wa it was in the process of uh, uh, making Indian constitution. But we were following a uh, government of India Act of 1935 at that time and Jammu and Kashmir, they had their own constitution since 1939. So, they were following their own constitution. So, when they signed instrument of accession, they signed in with a uh, 
condition that the arrangement whatever we are having now this arrangement cannot be altered unless the jammu and kashmir itself accept the new change so whatever the change if center government if indian government want to do that has to be accepted by uh, jammu and kashmir authorities jammu and kashmir government state government this was the arrangement made and this arrangement was mentioned under article 370 so article 370 was established under this arrangement on the whole there was no temporary or permanent mention here as long as jammu and kashmir they accept the center's uh, communication and coordination it is fine and it has to go through with article 370 that uh, and that has been mentioned in constitution especially to honor this uh, arrangement between two countries and the next question is what are the features of article 3370 you know the three important significant significant features you have to remember the one the first and primary the foremost is the power of parliament to make laws for state will be limited as i mentioned before only three aspect will be under the control of parliament that is defense communication and foreign affairs rest will be handled by jammu kashmir state government only so the power of parliament to make laws with respect to state it's clearly limited as mentioned in the constitution and then second feature of this uh, article 370 is parliament can make laws only with state government concurrence it means that i you know you know first uh, point it has been mentioned that it is limited it it means that yes parliament can make laws but the thing is that has to be accepted by state government if state government says that we are not going to accept what parliament is doing then it is end of the talk it means that whatever the decision taken by parliament that should go in concurrence with state government this is the second feature and the third feature is article 1 and article 370 article 1 is india the union of uh, the states and the article 370 it is applicable to state Uh, only these two articles are applicable to jammu and kashmir rest of the co constitution can be applicable only through the presidential orders parliament don't have direct uh, control over uh, jammu and kashmir but through the pre presidential order other aspects of constitu constitution can be applicable even there was condition with respect to that as well so these are the three primary features of 370 see president could declare it inoperative if there is such recommendation from state uh, constituent assembly it means that if the state uh, assembly the state constituent assembly if they find that this arrangement is not working in our favor we want a normal state uh, center arrangement like india has with other state then parliament pa the president can remove the article 370 this objective is also mentioned under 370 and central government use this objective to remove that to abrogate article 370 we'll see that in a uh, in, in that uh, next pa next part of this questionnaire and next thing is how was this special status removed see i'll explain it through this uh, diagram here see the arrangement between parliament and jammu kashmir government is that three issues parliament has got control and rest of the issues if parliament want to give some suggestions and want to give some orders to state government then that has to go through with constituent assembly if constituent assembly accepts it then that will be implemented in jammu kashmir so this was the arrangement but in 1957 jammu kashmir they uh, constituted uh, they changed their constitution constitution they implemented new constitution in 1957 after that what intelligently they did is in the place of constituent assembly they repealed it constitution at constituent assembly body they created a new body that is legislative assembly now parliament you know in a legal terms parliament can give its uh, the uh, whatever communication channel it will go through the constituent assembly on this is the legal channel when you repeal that entire body the parliament has no where legal connection to jammu kashmir because the, the new body has come legislative assembly according to the law you cannot give your uh, directions of orders to the legislative assembly it means that that connection between parliament and the jammu and kashmir government that has got cancelled now it has got autonomy parliament has got no control over jammu and kashmir government here parliament has control over or on three issues rest of it it lost its control and what uh, the bjp government in uh, 2019 it did was there was a loophole in that and it used that you know there was an article 367 where it changed the terminologies under article 367 it has mentioned that 
wherever the uh, term constituent assembly mentioned in article 370 will be considered as legislative assembly so now the parliament uh, the the connection parliament got the reconnection with uh, state governments of jammu and kashmir so parliament had connection only with constituent assembly now that constituent assembly is equal to legislative assembly only terminology changed but their activities are same now parliament can directly give connect uh, orders or directions to legislative assembly and legislative assembly it give it goes through the uh, Jammu and Kashmir state. On the whole, the central government got the control over Jammu and Kashmir again. So, this is the entire process uh, that deals, that talks about abrogation of article 370. See, the next question is what are the legal issues or what are the issues related with this aspect? See, the primary thing is this special status has been removed when there was a president rule. When there was a president rule, the governor becomes the constituent assembly, the governor becomes a legislative assembly. On a legal terms, yes, it holds true because even before through the presidential order only so many order has been executed with respect to Jammu and Kashmir. Now you cannot say that this is due to presidential order only you remove this status. It is not acceptable. No, it does not work that even before in the same manner few of the, the article 35A is also implemented from this perspective only. Now legally it holds good. So even in court you cannot say that it is illegal. That legality aspect is gone but what the petitioners are saying in court is see governor is not a people representative so you should have taken this decision when there was uh, uh, people there are assembly is in uh, power or when there are state pe people elected representative was were handling the authority but what you did is you cancelled the government through a pre and you uh, declared president rule so, in that president rule, governor got the control and through that you made this particular uh, provision elimination. So, it goes against the ethos at the first step. We had an agreement and it goes against that uh, spirit of that agreement. This is the issue here. And then another issue is Jammu and Kashmir has been bifurcated, it has been turned into an union territory and Ladakh region has been bifurcated from Jammu and Kashmir. Again, it goes against the signing spirit at that time. And, un and another thing is union government, it unilaterally took the decision and there is no state role in that. There were no people representative, there were no assembly, there were no MLS or MP who supported this move and entirely it is unilateral move, uh, unilateral move and this is what the uh, uh, author also talks about. These are the issues they should have been addressed uh, during abrogation of entire process and this is about this article. Let's move to the next one. Recently, the finance ministry of, a, uh, of our country has, has taken a decision to put import restrictions on uh, computer hardware like laptop, tablets, personal computer. So, this decision has been taken and many uh, editorials also come both in Indian Express and Hindu newspaper regarding a few of them uh, uh, taken a stand that it is necessary for our country to support our domestic production and domestic industry and some of the editorials, some of the articles have taken a stand against it that it is going to uh, affect the our country especially in a short term it is going to create a lot of issues with respect to software and uh, other sector also. But in this article, it is a questionnaire kind of thing and let's go through with that. It's a very simple article and it has been explained in a very simple way uh, here also. And what is the order uh, state exactly? What is the financial ministry order state exactly? It means that if you want to import uh, these items in our country, especially for the sale to the consumer, then you need to have a valid license. And this particular move will also make you to pay high duties on importing uh, these electronic equip equipments. So it is a way to discourage importing this. The valid license concept is one of the way to discourage these import restricted items into the country. Country. And another thing is, yes, if you want these items for our research and development activities, for testing or for evaluation or benchmarking, anything related to industrial development, then there is a permission given and permission is up to the 20 items. More than that, again, it will be considered as a commercial aspect, then you need to pay extra duties on that. So, this is what the basic order says. And what is the purpose behind this move? You know, main objective is to reduce the dependence on imports. Mainly, we are importing importing from a Chinese product and it is going to be uh, extremely security threat in future and even West also taking these steps to manufacture these electronic 
and hardware items in their own country they are also given the reason that main issue is a national security issue and here the primary objective is to reduce dependence on imports because it has implications in other sectors as well and it it another objective is to make the country uh, access to the trusted hardware and system see uh, what is happening that national security security factor if you see that recently the cyber attacks even the breakdown of indian uh, uh, cyber ecosystem in even the well reputed companies also we are seeing it somewhere it has been found out that it has directly linked to the hardware hardware and the uh, the system related to that they are the culprit in all these breakdowns so government took a step very seriously that we need to focus it on the whole we have to protect our uh, cyber ecosystem we have to protect our internet services ecosystem in our country in, in order to protect that we need to take st uh, steps we need to have a trusted software and trusted hardware systems in our country one way to you one way to have achieve this objective is to restrict these unqualified and inefficient hardware systems that we have been importing and uh, this move is directly focusing on that aspect of it to ensure country has access to trusted hardware and system so that we will avoid all untrusted hardware and software system into our country and the third purpose was to increase the domestic manufacturing of product obviously once you start stopped importing from other country then for the demand our country will have to process it see we we have an a manufactured establishment in our country it is not strong enough but because of these import restrictions it is going to give boost to these domestic companies and they are going to start production and in turn on a longer run it is going to increase the domestic manufacturing uh, products and also uh, manufacturing capacity of our country on the whole and we can become we can export from our country throughout the world if our systems if our company becomes very strong so these are the main purpose behind the move and the next question is is domestic production growing uh, yes especially in electronic goods manufacturing and electronic goods export it, it is growing in our country in uh, 2016 and 17 at that time we had uh, export quality we had production quality of 49 billion, uh, billion dollars at that time now it has almost doubled it is 87 billion dollar the entire uh, manufacturing the electronic goods manufacturing uh, sector is rising in our country i think it is showing up extremely positive growth and if you look at annual growth rate it is almost 15 percent but the issue here is hardware manufacturing capacity in our country and this uh, even though electronic manufacturing is increasing but specifically it hardware manufacturing it was progressively declining so government had to chip in government had to take proper steps so that on a long run we need to be in a positive way or else if the hardware technology is declining in our country it is directly going to affect the entire electronic manufacturing industry so to, to make sure that it is very competent to make to build that efficiency in our country government has taken this step to support it hardware manufacturing so on the whole the production whatever the positive aspect of electronic goods manufacturing is happening that has to be supplemented that has to be supported by it manufacturing also so in on in general if you look at it down the line even the whatever we seeing that it manufacturing decline it is going to see a positive move but the question is what is the uh, uh, what is going to happen at immediate next what are the uh, possible uh, things that is going to happen especially in the market for uh, these uh, electronic items in our country because import restriction is put in place and how we how is it going to affect the country that is the question mark the thing is there are concerns especially for the prices it is going to impact the prices the electronic hardware item prices is going to be increased that is what the uh, future expectations and also accessibility of stock will also be uh, vulnerable there will be volatility in the market this is the immediate response to the whatever uh, the finance ministry has taken and other uh, issue we are going to face is uh, foreign direct investment see many a country the foreign countries which are uh, which have uh, working in our country it, they are going to face some issues because these global companies have different criteria and they are working may need these kind of uh, uh, whether it's a laptop or any other it hardware goods for their working and this kind of decision is going to affect their working in our country on 
you know on the whole this kind of policy decision it is going to affect foreign direct investment and also the companies who are already working might also thinking to shift their base to some other southeast asian countries so this may or this is another concern this is another aspect is going to happen yes there are chances are there that uh, these global companies might shift their bases that is another uh, concern here and the uh, the next third one is you know it is fine there are some uh, negative aspects to it but there are some positive outcome outcomes are all going it's all going positive outcome is also going to happen there will be push for local assembly process of laptop companies see the companies like hp dell all these companies uh, only uh, out of uh, uh, we have like asus uh, dell uh, lenovo all these companies out of these india has very few companies have their assembly process in country assembly establishment in our country so by this new move all the other countries will also establish their assembly plant in india and in turn it is going to create employment and in turn it is going to generate national income uh, and it, it is going to push our uh, uh, electronic good manufacturing sector in our country it is going to push for local assembly processes all these laptop manufacturing or any other electronic item manufacturing companies they they will consider uh, implementing they will com consider having their own assembly plant in our country in turn in a long run it is going to help our country and finally it can cause market volatility as i told before yes on a shorter uh, shorter run it is going to cause but proper steps have to be taken if there is uh, for some genuine purpose uh, you can uh, government is going to give you uh, uh, permission to imp import few number of items and also uh, even with by having a valid license or by paying duties you can still import it is extreme if it is extremely important yes it is going to market volatility but it is it is a manageable volatility it is not that it is going to go out of hand but on the whole these are the things that is going to happen because of this decision uh, this is it about the day guys uh, thank you for listening have a good time i'll see you guys tomorrow